So good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, there was a little bit of sound, but I decided you know we didn't need to listen to uh, uh, Jay Z and uh, uh, Alicia Keys. So anyway, but uh, so here we are. Um, welcome to the Master of Architecture uh, curriculum overview. Uh, I'm Mario Gooden, the director of the Master of Architecture program, and it's really my sheer delight to welcome you to our fall open house. Um, I saw you know, a number of you uh, just over in Buell a few minutes ago or about a half an hour ago uh, for the Dean's presentation, um, which was very exciting. And I have to say that I was a little sort of exhausted after hearing about everything that's going on, uh, going on at our school. But I want to give us or give you a bit of an in-depth uh, look at the Master of Architecture program this afternoon. Um, so here we are um, in Avery Hall. There we were in Buell before, so now you're in Avery. Hopefully you also had a chance to take uh, a tour this morning. Um, but as you can see, Avery is a kind of dense combustion engine, as we like to talk, uh, as we like to call it. Um, the Master of Architecture program is one of 11 uh, programs in the building. Um, the architecture program, the architecture programs, the Master of Architecture program, and the Master of Science in Advanced Architecture Design sit atop of uh, the world's most foremost uh, architectural and arts library. This is the Avery, uh, the Avery Library. Um, and I would like to say that, you know, in addition to, let's say, the studios and the classrooms, uh, you know, being the spaces that you would occupy a lot when you're a student here, um, that I would hope that this would also be one of your favorite places on campus. Um, actually, uh, this library gets used most of the time by students not in architecture. <laughs> so if you go there um, at mid-review or at midterm or uh, near the end of the semester, there are students from many, many other schools that really love particularly this room, the reading room that's there on the, the first level when you enter, you know, to study and really sort of enjoy that uh, uh, as an atmosphere. As a matter of fact, I think when I was a student here some 30 X years ago, you know, my carol was right here and uh, my graduate carol, and that's where, that's where I studied. Lindy, you probably had a carol on this, on this level as well. <laughs> so, um, but moving on, so here, you know, you see we're there in Wood Auditorium. Um, you see that uh, the architecture programs are not only stacked above, you know, Avery Library, but then seep underground and then into Fairweather Hall. Hopefully you'll get a, an opportunity to, to see that, um, where there are, you know, the urban design programs and the real estate programs, and there are spaces that we use uh, from time to time as well. And the other sort of crucial uh, space that I would call your attention to, in addition to, uh, you know, the studios and the classroom, and particularly Avery Library, is the maker space um, or the, uh, you know, the shop. You know, this is where, um, as uh, Professor Bernard Schumi says, that architecture is the materialization of concept. So it's not just what we draw, but it's also what we make. That is a part of the representation. It is. Part of the part of the practice, if you will, of architecture. So, uh, GSAP and the MARC program, it's really, I would say, it's a global program. Um, and you know, at this time of planetary crisis, as we all know, our planet is going through enormous environmental, social, and technolo technological changes, and these manifest or made manifest across scales, uh, in which the ways in which the body, space, ecologies, politics, and aesthetics intersect and entangle. Um, these intersections are the terrain for the various disciplines in the school and very much the terrain for, uh, for the Master of Architecture program. However, uh, studying architecture or being an architect or studying about the built environment, there's not a recipe. And uh, one of the things, or three of the things that we say here within the Master of Architecture program is that we do not presume to know what architecture is. 
So some of you might be thinking, well, I thought you were going to come and you are going to come here and teach me what architecture is. As the dean said earlier, um, we're not going to sort of give you a certain kind of knowledge. We will work with you. And I think most of the faculty here, you know, we enjoy teaching because we are, uh, we are researching, we're learning uh, with you, and that is, part of the, that is part of the joy of teaching. Second, that architecture is not a given. And then that architecture is not a preconceived idea. So this is really where, uh, you know, the root of where we work from is that, again, there's no recipe. You don't take a little bit of this form and a little bit of this style and then put it in the oven at 350 degrees for 45 minutes and out pops a building or out pops, you know, a, a landscape or what have you. Um, but we think of architecture in terms of questions and also particularly given uh, the situations that we are faced today, um, we've been thinking about what does it mean to practice uh, radical pedagogy of uncertainty. Um, certainly we're living in uncertain times in terms of climate change, in terms of the fights for social justice, and I would say spatial justice, in terms of uh, uh, environmental degradation, uh, rampant capitalism, uh, the extreme sort of technological advances, you know, how do we um, think about these as architects? And so as part of, uh, let's say, the thought that uh, architecture is not a preconceived, uh, preconceived uh, condition, we're here to think about how do we design strategies uh, to combat or to confront these matters. So we're not... Uh, here to, let's say, try to solve you know, the world's problems, but we want to think architecturally. So how can we use the tools of architecture in order to, uh, to confront uh, these issues? And so practicing uncertainty uh, means thinking about the environment, thinking about the sort of deep time you know, of the place in which we are you know, situated here at Columbia University. And um, you saw in the Dean's presentation uh, and by the way, the sump pumps are right underneath this jute uh, rug here. So if we pull this up, you will see the sump pumps and also the creek um, that is uh, that runs beneath this campus. Um, and from the map that the dean showed us of Manhattan uh, from the 17th century uh, to the Vale map of the the late 17th century, um, you'll discover that you know this terrain that we are. You know, are situated upon um, is a terrain in which uh, there is a lot under our feet, um, a lot in terms of cultural practices, in terms of thinking about the environment, in terms of thinking about water, earth, and also the air around us. Now, that also makes manifest in, uh, in our design, uh, projects design studios. This is a student uh, designed and constructed uh, GSAP Web, which was for the end of the year show in 2022. Um, you saw this, uh, these images from the Natural Materials Lab. So thinking about other types of materials in terms of construction and the design of the built environment. Again, uh, the dean mentioned uh, that GSAP has always been on the forefront of thinking about the entanglement of these issues as well. This is the Race and Modern Architecture uh, book that was edited by Dr. Irene Chang and Professor Mabel Wilson, who you see here, and Dr. Charles Davis. And this book actually started as a workshop and symposium that took place in this room in 2017, actually. Um, so, you know, before, if you will, you know, the summer of 2020, GSEP was already involved in thinking about uh, the relationship between sort of race history and the making of the making of space. So now to get into an overview of our curriculum. The MARC program is uh, constructed, if you will, of uh, six strands. Uh, our design studios, our building science and technology sequence, uh, representation uh, sequence, our history theory sequence, uh, professional practice, and our electives. And you will uh, meet some of our professors who are teaching across these strands. Uh, Professor uh, Lindy Roy is here. 
Uh, we'll, we'll be here for our Q&A and Alessandro Orsini, um, who teaches professional practice, and Ray Wang, who uh, coordinates uh, architectural design and representation uh, one. And these strands are something of a kind of DNA, if you will. So again, uh, in, in the blue, the top strand being the design studios and uh, from uh, across the six semesters of the three-year MARC program, um, we have you know, a number of, of studios and then you see our technology sequence, um, the courses of our representation sequence, uh, history theory requirements in the first year, but then a number of electives and offerings, uh, professional practice, and then uh, uh, electives that you are free to take in the, uh, in the final semester. But the way that our curriculum is constructed, uh, the first three semesters are constructed around the idea or the question, of, if you will, of questions of architecture. Um, so we begin thinking about what are the questions of architecture in terms of the environment, in terms of climate, in terms of reparations, in terms of care, in terms of ecology, and then how do those, uh, how do we construct strategies thinking of using the tools of architecture in terms of detail and structure and thinking about scale and, uh, and proportion. Um, and in the uh, final three semesters, um, we move from questions to then sort of, okay, how do we, let's say, practice these questions? How do we think about practicing uh, uncertainty. And so just to sort of come back and look at these in a bit more detail. So in the, uh, in the first semester, questions of architecture, again, around questions of embodiment, ecology, environment, care, equity, reparation, and as I mentioned, um, how do we design strategies using architecture in terms of scale, materiality, space, structure, detail, and relations. You know, uh, in our building uh, technology sequence, environments uh, in architecture, in representation, what are the tools of representation? Again, in relationship to these questions. And then much more directly in our history uh, class, required history class, questions of architecture, history, and I was speaking with one of you at, uh, at lunch, and we were talking about the way in which at GSAP we restructured our history uh, sequence uh, several years ago, such that when I was a student, uh, and a number of my colleagues here, when we were students, we started with uh, ancient Greece and then moved sort of linearly through time, but it was really based upon a kind of European understanding of, of history and European understanding of architectural history. Our history uh, sequence is constructed around space and time. So while, yes, we may look at uh, Renaissance, we're also looking at what was going on parallel to the Renaissance in the British colonies or in the French colonies or in, uh, or in the Portuguese colonies. So we're situating uh, and, and really sort of understanding that uh, uh, European epistemology is also a product of colonization, right? And much of, you know, the experiments which were happening, whether or not they were scientific experiments or ethnographic experiments, uh, whether or not there were even urban design experiments, were being played out in the colonies and then sort of brought back to, uh, brought back to home, so to speak. And then in the second semester, thinking about how do we deploy architecture um, as the production of knowledge? So what are other epistemologies? How do we construct knowledge using architecture? And again, confronting questions of embodiment, ecology, environment, care, equity, and, uh, and reparation. That follows through in terms of th now thinking about structures in architecture architectural representation and drawing again, and then questions of architectural history too. So moving from, uh, let's say, post-Renaissance into, uh, I don't know if I want to call it the post-colonial era because we're still kind of in an era, era of coloniality, 
but moving in terms of the era of coloniality, I suppose, in terms of questions of, of architectural history. And then in the third, uh, third semester, beginning to now think of architecture as situated practice. And this is something that the dean sort of spoke about, that we do not necessarily think of architecture or any of the uh, disciplines within GSEP as operating within a vacuum or in abstraction, but thinking about uh, uh, the real world in terms of uh, situating these, in terms of how do we put these into, into practice. And by practice, I don't mean necessarily mean professional practice. That is certainly a part of it. But how do we put these into practice in terms of a way of thinking, a mode of thinking, using architectural thought um, as, a, as a way of engaging the world and engaging the issues and uh, planetary crises that we're confronted with? Um, and again, this then comes down to our other sequences in terms of the technology sequence. Our, our history theory sequence, and as you will see, uh, professional practice as well as representation. Then in the fourth semester, uh, contested territory. So now we're working at larger scales, um, larger scales thinking about extraction, where do materials come from? Where are they sourced? Um, thinking about labor, how does labor and the uh, how is labor used, how is labor perhaps even exploited within the design and construction process. So we're really thinking about architecture's entanglement you know, at a much larger scale, not just, let's say, the building scale or the local scale, but at a scale that uh, is much, much, uh, much, much broader. And this comes down to questions, again, of ecology, environment, carbonization, extractivism, equity, and reparation. And here, this ties directly into our technology sequence because we're thinking about construction, uh, material sources, life cycles of materials, in terms of representation, and history theory, in terms of our seminars and electives and distribution requirements. In the fifth and sixth semester, uh, practicing uncertainty. And what does that mean? How do we think about architecture's entanglements uh, and the intersectionalities uh, of architecture with regimes of power? And how do we deploy architecture as a, again, as a practice to confront uh, these issues and to, and to confront power structures? And you see we have our technology uh, electives, history theory, distribution requirements, and professional practice. And while officially you see that you know, there is a professional practice course, there are actually two professional practice courses, there's a required course and an advanced professional practice uh, elective, practice and the question of practice is actually situated across the curriculum. Um, and that gets uh, played out in a number of ways in terms of symposiums, in terms of having uh, guest speakers in all of our uh, studios come and meet with students, have conversations with students, and talk about, let's say, real world issues and how do we think about sort of architecture in terms of, uh, in terms of these, uh, these issues. And then in the final semester, again, practicing uncertainty. And you see there are a number of, uh, of blue bars in both of these. Um, the fall semester is our uh, Studio 5. And hopefully, uh, some of you will have a chance to go upstairs. Today, we're uh, in mid-reviews for, uh, for Studio 5. Studio 5 actually brings together the Master of Architecture students and the uh, second term Master of Science and Arch Advanced Architectural Design. And uh, reviews just started today, mid-reviews, and they go through Thursday. But I invite you to, uh, to visit uh, as many of the mid-reviews uh, as you can. And what you will see is that there is a kind of diverse ecology of of studios um, that happen in the fifth and sixth semester. Uh, actually, there are 18 uh, studios this fall uh, in the, uh, the studio, five, uh, studio 5 sequence. Uh, I, I believe about six of them are having mid-reviews uh, mid today. Uh, so now, how does this all sort of play out in terms of 
requirements. Um, you will find this information on, uh, on the school's website, you know, in terms of, you know, what's required uh, you know, per semester. And then where you see these, uh, the empty sort of block, those are also opportunities for you to take other electives, uh, which could be additional visual studies electives, or I should say representation electives, or additional um, uh, history theory uh, electives or seminars, or perhaps even uh, if you are a uh, thinking about uh, doing a dual degree, you know, maybe taking uh, an elective, you know, in another uh, in another program or even a program outside of outside of GSAP. So very quickly here, I'm just going to go through the, you know, uh, just show you some, some slides uh, and get to give you a kind of taste of, uh, of the work that's produced in the different sequences. Uh, Professor Lola Benelon uh, will be joining us a little bit later this afternoon and you can, we'll also have the opportunity to ask more questions about the technology sequence, work that's produced in the technology sequence. Um, you know, very much thinking about construction and detail, but may perhaps thinking about construction and detail, I won't even say with alternative materials because I think it is time that we sort of think about, really uh, think about carbonization and think about the kinds of materials in which we are, are constructing the built environment. Um, but also getting into the, you know, the technical issues of lighting and acoustics. Um, but when it comes down to it, our sequence lies uh, you know, on top of four pillars, which are equity and health, climate and energy, uh, high tech and low tech, if you will, um, and, uh, and design build. So uh, very quickly, uh, I mentioned the tech one environment in, in architecture. So here, we're not only thinking about the environment in terms of, a, of an abstract sense, but also environments in terms of embodiment, uh, thermal comfort, if you will. Um, tech two is about sort of structures, and structures when it comes down to it, you know, I would say is somewhat intuitive, right? Thinking about um, the relationship between materials and how materials go together, and um, their relationship to gravity, if you will. You know, how do they come together in terms of materials and assembly? Um, so once again, if architecture is the materialization of concept, then how do you construct a concept? not just the concept theoretically, but how does that translate to, uh, to actual construction? And then construction in the life cycle of, uh, of materials um, that we use in, uh, in building in Tech 5 in the fifth semester. Uh, Professor Benalan is also the director of the Natural Materials Lab, um, and the Natural Materials Lab here at GSAP has really been on the sort of leading edge, if you will, of thinking about the use of, uh, uh, of uh, biomaterials, of earthen materials, um, and there was just a uh, uh, new materials uh, symposium that was here uh, two weeks ago. And representation, and you'll hear a little bit more from Professor Wei Wang uh, before we end this afternoon. Uh, you can also see some of this work on our website and also uh, the end of the year show examples from architectural drawing and representation one, and uh, work from uh, architectural drawing and representation two, which happens in the spring of the first year. And here you see, uh, this is from the, uh, from the MAKE uh, uh, elective, uh, seminar elective. Uh, that, and I want to come back to this thought of uh, that we don't necessarily, you know, uh, pretend that we know what architecture is, um, and I think that also comes down to thinking about materials, uh, because if drawings are, let's say, a representation of an architectural idea, buildings are actually also a representation of a concept, right? The building is, or the built environment is a translation of a concept. So then how does that translate in terms of uh, materials and the kinds of materials that get deployed in the built environment. And then history theory. Uh, and history theory at GSAP is not thought of as something which is at the service, if you will, of design. But history 
theory and design work very closely together. And uh, Professor Reinhold Martin is joining us and will perhaps have more to say about uh, history theory here that, uh, later this afternoon. I'll just keep going through all of these very quickly. Uh, the Dean mentioned the Buell Center earlier, um, our illustrious history theory faculty, uh, professional practice, and you'll hear from uh, Professor Orsini. Uh, professional practice is also taught by uh, Professor Robert Herman. Uh, our design studios. Uh, in the fall, we have uh, the first semester of each of the three years. So um, if you go upstairs, not only will you uh, have an opportunity to see what's going on in the uh, semester five reviews, but you can also visit uh, the studios, uh, Studio One, which is our first semester first year studio that is currently being coordinated by visiting Professor Impo Metsipa. And this is some of the work from, uh, from just a year ago. And uh, I was having a conversation uh, at lunch uh, about the relationship between uh, candidates for the MARC program who have an architecture background versus candidates who do not have a, an architecture background. And I will say that um, for those of you who do not have an architecture background, it is certainly not an impediment. Um, we welcome you. Um, and uh, what you will find is that, let's say, the, the tools that, uh, that you use or that you will be using here, um, those you will pick up, you know, uh, I would say somewhat uh, easily. Um, and it's really the, your colleagues who have an architecture background who I think will actually perhaps be learning, you know, just as much from you as you will be learning from, uh, from them. Um, one of the things that I would also say to, uh, to some of the students who have architecture backgrounds is perhaps forget what you think you know about architecture, such that, um, uh, again, we don't presume to know what architecture is. Uh, I won't say that you're starting tabula rasa, but we want to question uh, those assumptions. And in that way, um, those without an architecture background and those with an architecture background are actually somewhat starting, I would say, on a level playing field. Um, and you will be a kind of amazed at the, you know, at the conversations that can, that can take place in that first year, which is an, an exciting, that first semester, which is an exciting time uh, in, the, uh, in the curriculum. And these are just some images from, uh, from final reviews uh, last December. Then to, uh, hopefully you'll also have an opportunity to visit uh, the housing studios, which are on the 500 level. Um, that's coordinated by Professor Hillary Sample. This is some work from uh, from last fall as well. And again, the Studio 5 work from last fall. Um, you'll uh, have an opportunity to attend some of the mid-reviews which are going on, uh, going on now. I won't play that because you saw that in the Dean's presentation. <laughs> And then I would just say uh, there is so much to uh, also to unpack on the school's website. Please also avail yourself of the end of the year show. Um, this happens uh, you know, every spring in May at, at graduation, um, but it's not only for graduating students. You'll find work of all of the programs, um, of all of the courses um, in the MARC program uh, are represented in the, uh, in the end of the year show. So please avail yourself of the school's website uh, for that. Um, so Darwin, if you would stand. Uh, this is Darwin Eng. Darwin is the assistant director of the Master of Architecture program. Um, uh, I'm sure not only will some of you be in contact with in our admissions office and uh, uh, Dean uh, Stefan Boddicker, but if you have uh, questions about uh, requirements or what have you, you can also uh, reach out to, uh, to Darwin or myself. So, uh, so now I'd like, actually like to ask uh, the faculty who are here, uh, Professor Reinhold Martin, uh, Ray Wang, uh, Gal uh, Galia is not 
yet here, Lindy Roy and Alessandro Orsini, if you would join me here. Um, and we will open it up for any, any questions that you may have. Hi. Thank you, all, first of all, for, for coming. And, and uh, so I'm Reinhold Martin. I am an historian of architecture uh, here at GSEP, uh, where I, as it says somewhere, coordinate the, in, in terms of the MARC program, at least the history and theory uh, part of the curriculum, uh, which is a significant portion of what students here uh, do beginning with the first semester. In fact, I currently am doing this right now because we, you know, I teach, I teach in, the, in this thing. So it's called Questions in Architectural History. Uh, these are the two core required architectural history courses that, that we do. Uh, and so I'm currently teaching a group of your, you know, those of you who might join, our pre uh, predecessors. Uh, who are the first year MARC students, and I know we share we share we share these students. <laughs> we, they spend the, some um, Wednesday morning with us, and then they go over to Lindy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and you know, there's many much more to say about the curriculum, but but I, that's maybe more interesting to kind of develop through Q and A than a speech. So. <laughs> That's my, okay, so, so I'm Lindy, I, um, yes, I'm te I teach in the core, right now I'm teaching in the- Oh, sorry. Yes, okay. like that. Thank you. <laughs> With this, I always forget. Um, I'm Lindy Roy, I'm teaching the first semester uh, in the core, which is always, I think, the best place to teach in the school, uh, for a lot of the reasons that Mario brought up. Um, there's this incredible mix of students who have an architecture background and know how to do stuff and students coming with incredibly beautiful undergraduate degrees in other disciplines that really create an unbelievably compelling environment for thinking and learning. And that's certainly been the case. Um, it is the case this semester. Um, so should, should, uh, uh, should we just... Keep going. So, um, okay, so I also teach um, a seminar. And again, to Mario's point, you're going to encounter faculty here who are deeply um, involved in their own work. And so one's own research and thinking is active and it's active in the studio um, and in the other classes. So for me, um, I mean, I was thinking coming up here, like just two years ago, it might have been, it might have sounded a little dramatic to say that the climate crisis compels us to imagine other ways or other forms of human existence. Um, but now it's just a fact, right? So, so, so how do we begin to think about these things? And the curriculum's interest in uncertainty um, for me is a very, very powerful, um, it's not even an entry point, it's, it's a way of being as you're working. And my research is, um, I work with neuroscientists um, in the seminar I teach called, I guess it's this semester, it's called Nervous Systems, um, really looks at, looks to neuroscience not as a metaphor or as a kind of prescription for cause and effect. If you know how to do this, you'll elicit this response. But really, it looks at neuro to neuroscience for its extraordinary models um, for dealing with uncertainty, risk, and change. Um, and that class is also transdisciplinary, bringing students in from other schools as well. Oh. All right. Um, my name is Alessandro. Um, I teach here. Um, in the professional practice sequence, as Mario said. Um, and I agree with, with, uh, with Lindy in the fact that you will encounter a lot of uh, professors that are entrenched in their own research and there are some of them practicing, like myself. Um, and, and so uh, you, you will see a lot of our research that is brought into the studio space. Um, but um, also, um, you will notice uh, how certain type of seminars or courses, like something that is 
really much related to the building of architecture or the profession of the architect, like the professional practice course, is actually um, very much related um, to the practicing uh, uncertainty that is the curriculum, the core curriculum, um, and also the core curriculum of um, climate, um, equity, um, and, and data design. And um, we um, rewrote the sequence, Mario, I, and other faculty. And so we started to sort of uh, um, bring forward um, a lot of questions that uh, relate to the responsibility of the architect itself towards the built environment, towards how are we going to practice architecture uh, in this moment uh, of uncertainty. And so, um, yeah. Um, I think I'm looking forward if you if you have uh, questions and so on. Thanks, Alessandro. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Wang. I'm uh, coordinating the first year representation class, and um, you know I, I loved Mario your presentation and your idea that we need to you know not presume that we know what architecture is, right? And so then, the, in some sense, that's a, that's quite a challenge for the drawing class because how do you draw something that you don't know what it is? Um, but it's it's also great, right? Because you know I love teaching this class because I think drawing is in a lot of ways, uh, at least for me personally, like what pulled me into the profession in, in the first place. You know, uh, but we quickly realized that architectural drawing isn't just making a nice image, right? Like every line you draw. Uh, you know, tells someone, you know, how much concrete to mix, right? Tells a worker where to put a beam, right? Tells someone how many trees to cut down. So we really have to start questioning, you know, what does it mean to draw uh, in our day and age? And especially now with, um, you know, all these new technologies that seem to change, you know, month to month, right? You know, you guys probably heard of BIM and like VR, AR, uh, now we have like generative AI. So in this sort of new space of technology and tools, you know, what is the function of, of architectural drawing and, and representation? So that's something that we look at really closely. And we look at that by sort of trying to relearn and rethink the fundamentals of what it means to represent architecture, right? What is the plan? What is the section? What is the physical model? Uh, what is the animation? What does that all mean in, in today's age? Um, and so in other words, to summarize, I think you will be learning tools to make really amazing representations, but we will also be exploring your representations and your drawings themselves as a kind of tool to be learned uh, from. Great, so questions? Hi, my name is Nina Lasero. Um, so earlier in your in your speech, you were talking about how students ask questions. What are students at the GSAP asking? What are the questions that they're interested in? What topics are you, is the GSAP interested in ex researching? Wow, um, that's a very good question. Um, Thanks for that question. I, one, I think you should also ask some students when you're, uh, when you're around today. Um, but I, it seems to me that students are, it's actually a very big question. Students are asking, why should they become an architect? Uh, why should we build? Or should we build? Um, that's a very big question. Uh, that's uh, not just for students. I think it's, it's a question that should be put to the profession of architecture. Um, not just not just the discipline, and not just within the within the academy. And if we build, how do we build? Um, how do we build uh, responsibly? How do we think about, let's say, the life cycle of materials? How do we think about where those materials are coming from? How do we think about the processes, you know, in terms of extraction or not, in terms of in terms of material? So it's a very big question of. Um, I would say not why do we build, but should we build? And I think also questions of technology and you know, really um, of act, active in studio and active in the uh, tech sequence. And I'm sure. Yeah, I can. 
Yeah. 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 And then the questions around that would be as varied as the students, right? As, but it's def yeah, it's it's um, and the the ADR course which works very closely with studio is another kind of forum where you know we're like hurry up, let's get the skill level up so that we can start to um, get closer to some of the ideas that are emerging in studio while skills are being developed. Even if you've got a background, there's new technology, there's new, you know, new ways of making things, new way of thinking about communicating your design um, or, or communicating your thinking. Um, that's very, very active. So, yeah, so I, w I would, that's a great question. And it's difficult to answer in, in a sweeping way because I think you'll you know, get different answers across the board if you, no matter who you had on this panel. Uh, but I can report to you two things uh, from, again, I'm, as I'm saying, I'm teaching currently about one third of the uh, current MARC class in history uh, in the class with a queue in front of it. So questions are already built in, questions in architectural history. So we pose them questions. That's part two of my question. My part, part one of it is probably something you're all asking too in addition to the immediate urgencies. Uh, you know, different versions of the question of what happened. This is the kind, like, what happened? How did this happen? How did, you know, it could, you could pose this relative to climate, relative to world conflicts of various kinds, and, and so on. And, you know, architecture finds itself often in the middle of these type of situations, as I guess you just, you know, you could just hear about technological questions and climate. Uh, but these are frequently not new questions. And, and so that's one of the things that we try to do in response is to answer the question concretely with facts, right? It's not just all questions. There are facts. Something happened. Uh, and, and then explain that. And it could have to do with the design and construction of a particular building. It could have to do with the oppression of whole peoples in order such that that building would have been built, or the building itself as a machine to oppress and or liberate, and you know, you get into many very, very difficult and often contradictory situations with architecture. So that's that's a that, that's a it's it's a kind of churn that just keeps going. Um, but but be reassured, I, I really want to emphasize this: things happen, right? Unfortunately, before our very eyes, in ways that we are, you know, often horrified by. But things happen. And, uh, and, and that's part of our responsibility, is to understand how things happen. Uh, and they don't happen passively, they are made to happen. So architecture is a, a domain in which of makers, of people who make things happen, whether it has to do with the design of something or the enabling of something through that design or the, con or the prevention of something through that, so, and so on and so on. I asked a question the other day to my student. This is, I do this every, week, every year, I have to say. So there's a famous text from the, sorry, this is very esoteric. Uh, but hey, we're in graduate, this is graduate school in the Ivy League. So um, uh, there's a famous text uh, in, from the 19th century in Prussia, in, 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 in what would become Germany, uh, called In What Style Should We Build? That, that's titled as a question. So I mean, people nodding, they've maybe read it. And, uh, and, and so we discuss many aspects of that, but that, that's, they read that text and we contextualize it. I give them, I explain what this means, something about the author, and so on. Um, Heinrich Hübsch is the author, he's an architect. Uh, but one of the, 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 you know, just even, that might seem like an anachronistic question to you, right? Like in what style? We don't really talk about style very much anymore. Uh, I suggested to the students the other day that maybe this question is not resolved. Uh, and maybe there's still something in this question. Why? For two reasons. One is that style is something typically that is produced collectively by entire societies, entire eras or epochs, and it has been understood as, as that. And so thinking in those terms asks us to think not just what, what it doesn't say what style should I build or design, it says we. Uh, and, and you know who that we is, is. and that's a absolutely critical in face of the various crises that you know everybody is aware of, right? Uh, the we, right? 
And then there is this, this we itself. So in, that, in what style should we build? Who is this we? Uh, in that context, it wasn't yet we Germans, but it was soon to become we Germans. It was in the early 19th century. So this, this is the earlier phase of the development of nation, modern nation states as we you know, have inherited them, such that we can maybe that, that phrase, we Germans, echoes in ways to our ears that didn't quite, you know, wasn't, weren't really um, available at that time. So the we of nationalism, basically. So there's the we of a collective, bearing collective responsibility for cultural expression, something like style, which is hardly superficial, it's profound. Uh, and and in, in these and other ways, and then there's that, the other aspects of this, of a, of a default we, like a we who belong in this room, and we might be doing building, but somebody else is going to be on the receiving end of what we design or build. And so that we is both an inclusive and an exclusive term. So, so that's, that's the kind of work that questions can do. So I thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned kind of in your, in your talk that you're questioning what architecture is, but also that we're defining questions of whether we should even build or whether architects should be people who design how they design space and looking at that not just as the singular building, but as the entire velocity of the building from creation, whether that's exploitation of materials or labor to um, demise. And so I think in kind of that framing, I'm curious what collaboration within GSAP looks like across uh, disciplines and programs, say from architecture and real estate, um, because some of those questions are not just architectural, but are economic in um, questioning what it looks like to redesign economic systems that necessitate building. And so um, I'm just curious what that looks like within the program and courses and studios um, and wherever else. Yeah, that, thanks. That, that's really a great question. Um, and, and I'll say a couple of things uh, about that. I think um, the question of collaboration is not only, I would say, a, a question about um, what's happening across the disciplines, but it's also a question about what's happening in within the discipline. And I think one of the... <clears throat> uh, one of the things that's happening not only in the, within the school, uh, but perhaps within, not as much in the profession as yet, but there is a, a beginning of a decentering of the architect, of the kind of heroic figure of the architect, such that, um, uh, and I think we do this quite well within the Airmark program, uh, is offering opportunities for collaborative work you know, in the design studio in certain, in certain courses. So that's, so that's one in terms of you know, rec the recognition that uh, nothing gets built kind of singularly or a kind of singular, singular genius. And I think there are a number of examples in architectural history of, you know, whether or not it is, you know, if you could think of, you know, Eileen Gray or others who, you know, were not given proper credit when we know that, you know, these works were not just kind of singularly sort of done. So the idea of the singular genius. Then in terms of more practically in terms of uh, collaboration across disciplines, there are opportunities uh, we have, and they do not have a mid-review today, but uh, their mid-review, I think, is later this week. Um, we have a joint architecture and uh, preservation studio in the, uh, in the Studio 5. Um, so there are those opportunities. We have architecture and planning studio in Studio 4. Um, we have architecture and real estate in studio and studio six. And so we're looking for, and we're also trying to construct more opportunities. At the moment, those are singular studios within each one of those semesters. But we are also looking for opportunities, for example, that all of the architecture studios, for example, in the fourth semester would be collaborating with planning studios, urban planning studios, for example, and more opportunities for, uh, for collaboration with, uh, with the real estate, because you're exactly right. That also perhaps means redesigning you know, economic systems. So that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, I cannot but build a thing because
because um, these are um, all questions that we cover in the professional practice course as well, um, in which the, the new course is really uh, more uh, designed to, to tackle all these issues of ethics, equity, labor exploitation, or environmental exploitation. Um, but um, it, it's very interesting to see how uh, all these things are intertwined, and we just had our midterm review on Friday, and so part of the course is um, students will uh, sort of exercise on um, forming a firm, a design firm, and so all those questions on how we design, for whom we design, and how we consider the context of architecture are really embedded in the course. And so, for example, uh, one of these questions that you said, the collaboration with real estates and, and the redesign of economic uh, systems and circularity, uh, they were really brought forward this past Friday in which um, um, a lot of students had a, a firm that was a design firm associated with a real estate um, for, for, for this specific purpose of understanding how to create uh, a different kind of uh, um, financial paradigm behind the construction of architecture. So in a sense, the, the way that uh, Professor Martin was explaining how the question of architecture are design, it's the, the, the professional practice one is uh, also design intertwined with all this question of ethics and so on. Um, I was just gonna ask, uh, how is GSAP, is GSAP embracing the idea of AI? How is that being embedded into the curriculum? I know, because I know people, like I hear people using, um, you know, chat GBT or other AI softwares to create pretty realistic renders or drawings and come up with programs and full projects for their thesis or something. So what, what is y'all's stance on that? And is that something y'all are embracing? <laughs> We're embracing, I would say, uh, the possibilities. We do not have, um, I think we are, there are a number of experiments. There are some uh, studios that are experimenting with, uh, you know, with things like mid-journey and, and what have you. But in terms of, and, and I'll let Brian Hull also kind of talk about it in terms of writing and, yeah. and what have you. <laughs> um, uh, but it is something that, that we're actively exploring and, um, you know, I would say the school has always kind of been on the forefront of technology, and in this case, I, you know, uh, AI has really been moving very, very quickly. Um, it was just a few weeks ago or, or so there was, a, you know, another, um, uh, what seems like a sort of another um, generation of, you know, of AI. Um, but at the moment, what we are asking students to do is wherever and whenever AI is used is to cite their references um, in, terms of that, uh, in terms of that use. Um, but we're, I would say, are extremely interested in what the potentials are. I would say what the potentials and the risk and kind of knowing, you know, so we're not adopting something blindly or suggesting that students use it blindly, but understanding, you know, it and all of its, in its kind of full context, if you will. Yeah, no, I mean, because obviously this has, hit the headlines probably first, like in high schools and, you know, people writing their paper, I'm sure all of you in one way or the other. If you've been in school recently, you would have faced this issue already. Uh, and the straightforward answer is no, you cannot write your paper with it, with ChatGPT, unless you, my, some of, I, I, I will just, I'm just echoing conversations amongst, you know, people who grade these papers, unless, of course, you'd like ChatGPT to grade the paper also. So, in other words, there is a human-to-human -human <laughs> kind of critical dimension to all the work that, that we do, and I don't think that's going to change. Uh, the, but the, the way in which these relations are mediated is changing, and this is among them. It's not the only one. Uh, and so uh, I have just two more. One is very philosophical. The other is more concrete answer. People around here, every, you can't turn anywhere on a campus like this without somebody thinking critically, imaginatively, technologically about, and you know, even financially, about, about these, these types of questions. I'm part of something called the Committee on Global Thought here in which we're 
we're organizing a panel, in a, a panel discussion in a couple of weeks on AI and labor, which is about what, like, what's not in the newspaper. So it's kind of related. It's in the spirit of, of some of the things you just heard, you know, from my colleagues, uh, of you know who is training the AI to to recognize happiness or something like that. It, this is these are people who are not paid the, uh, at the scale uh, by any means that the people who design the AI are paid, uh, or those of us who use it, you know, are paid. Uh, and and in fact, they're typically not. In, they're they're in the typically in the global south and countries like Kenya and so on, where English is spoken, but nonetheless, there's, you know, there's all, there are conditions, there are historical conditions. Okay, that's one. So there's, so that, it's just yet another case in which we want to think critically, historically, contextually about technology. You know, it, it's really, honestly, I, I don't think it's that different. And then the other thing, the philosophical, is that it seems to me, I don't know, I don't, won't go into the whole thing, but if you're familiar with the Turing test, this is one way to think about it. The, the, the problem, the, the, what AI is, the question that it's posing to us is who are we? Like not who is, of course, what is this new machine? But whenever there's a new machine, there's a question of, of the user and the maker of the machine. Who are we such that we can't tell the difference between a paper written by an AI and a paper written by a, a human student? So that kind of question, that's an interesting question. And then we can contemplate those type of questions in an academic setting. Well, actually, that. That's part of my interest um, in working with neuroscience as well, where you know these cognitive-based technologies like AI are infiltrating our lives, and of course how we design and how we think about design. Um, and neuroscience gives sort of an, a, a pretty incredible window into starting to think about, um, you know, as we start to deal with these technologies, to think critically about them but also ways of starting to think about these melded assemblies um, that we increasingly work with of matter and data um, and, and dealing with human, more than human, and artificial intelligence, right? All sort of within one um, sort of construct as you're working to sort of theoretically think through how, how does one um, how does one begin to develop tools to think through these issues? Um, so that's... Maybe yeah, we'll yeah just maybe a final, final comment, because I think the rendering question really, I think, got to the heart of some of what we've been talking about in, in our architectural drawing representation class. I mean, and, but I want to go back to, you know, what Mario presented, right? Like, we come in here presuming not to know what architecture is. And if you think about what AI is, it presumes the exact opposite, right? It knows exactly what architecture is because it's based off of this, you know, large image model of all the architecture it's seen basically like on the internet, right? And if you think about that a little bit more, then you start to realize, well, what kind of architectural images get on the internet? Right? It's mostly probably like portfolio images, glossy images by developers trying to sell a specific, you know, product, even architectural firm like best glitziest images. So that's what AI thinks, you know, architecture is, right? It's based on this catalog of images and it talks nothing about process or design and knows nothing of those things, right? So if you're thinking about AI as a tool, you need to be aware that that's the specific perspective that that AI tool kind of comes to the table with. And if you do have questions and you see any of us around the building later today, please come up and uh, and speak with us, and just another reminder to come back here in this room uh, at 6.30 for uh, Professor Mark Sermaki uh, lectures and lectures. It's really going to be awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.